When we're in wakefulness in the physical world right now, everything is more or less stable. We have stable space, no external changes occur around us. It seems to us that we're located at a single stable point. At the same time, that's all a delusion. For example, our state of consciousness in the phase is also fluid, and full awareness is sometimes lost. Sometimes you can't even figure out whether there's consciousness, whether you're truly self-aware. In real life, there's the same problem, it's imperceptible. The fact is that if you lose a little awareness and controllability in the phase, that will be immediately reflected in the space. Absurd things and changes to the space start to arise, and it's perceptible. In fact, our consciousness fully controls only a small percentage of each day. Most of the time, I even hold seminars 90% on autopilot, halfway in trance. That is, full human awareness is an illusion. Sometimes it turns on you. You're sitting down, realize what's going on, and then it's as if you fall into a half trance. But since space is stable in reality, there is no effect at all on it. And it seems to us we're conscious and awake the whole time. But in fact, that's an illusion. For that very reason, it's no surprise that consciousness in the phase is periodically fluid. That is, now it's on, now it's off. And it's not that it's like that in the phase, it's that our consciousness is like that in principle. In reality, it's also constantly fluid, so it's very difficult to be conscious all the time, and there's no need to be anyway. Stopping the internal dialogue is one of the most beneficial phase-related practices. It allows you to enter the phase better and stay in it longer. If during an attempt you're analyzing what you do and how you do it, that means you're doing techniques wrong and not pouring yourself into them. If you start analyzing during an attempt, thinking about what you're doing and how you're doing it, you're simply not making an attempt right. Because when you're all in an action and pour all of yourself into it, you won't have any room left for analysis. Sure, somewhere in the background you understand what you're doing, but when you dive right into an action, there's no analysis evident yet, and everything starts working. If anyone's at all interested in somnology, there was a famous somnologist, Alexander Vayan. He considered REM sleep to not only be the most mysterious of states, but also called it wakefulness directed within. He even called it an autonomic storm. Normally, when you experience this phase of sleep, you're asleep and don't know about these spikes in blood pressure, heartbeat, and so on. But those things are always there in the practice of the phase. And when you return from a phase in which you experience something vividly, naturally you'll get those ups and downs. But they're nothing dangerous. What slows down improvement in your body exit success rate? The main thing that determines 90% of your success is sound sleep. And the second is just paying attention when performing techniques. That's it. There's a list here of the 15 main reasons why it might not have worked. I can just read them out for you. Lack of an attempt to separate. In this case, that means that somebody either makes no attempt to separate, or some of the right sensations came, but they still don't try to separate. Lack of aggression. Fewer than four cycles. I don't even want to ask who of you did four cycles during unsuccessful attempts. Most of you did one, two, or max three cycles. It didn't work after that, and you probably fell asleep. Unjustified change of technique. Yesterday, we also had it. A technique is working, and we change it. Somebody sat here and told us about it. Unjustified continuation of a technique. A technique isn't working, but a person continues doing it. Forgetting to separate. We also talked about that. A technique worked, and it's time to separate. But a person continues doing the technique. Excessive analysis. We also spoke about that today. If you don't concentrate on your actions, your energy will go to analysis as a result. If you have excessive analysis during an attempt, that means you aren't doing the attempt itself right. Alert false awakening. You've awoken and it seems that nothing is going to work. The result is either a lame attempt or none at all. However, an alert awakening might be a false one. Attempting for over a minute. If you've awoken, there's no point in doing an attempt for more than a minute. Several of you probably lied down and did it for a few minutes non-stop. Incomplete separation. We also talked about that yesterday. If separation has begun, many will give up where they simply need to carry on. Dig in their heels, change the direction of their efforts, and separation will always continue. Not recognizing the phase. We also discussed this a lot during the first lesson. Somebody gets up but has vague sensations and thinks that it didn't work. 
However, it had only been necessary to deepen. The space does not coincide, and he thinks he's not in the phase, although the phase it is. Or he gets up, but his body's not on the bed. Again, it seems that it's not the phase, although it's only your expectation that the body should be on the bed. Awakening to movements. Someone wakes up upon moving. Or didn't try anything at all afterwards. Or tries, but very unconfidently. What a lack of confidence brings is something we already discussed at the first lesson. Wasting the first moments. Someone wakes up and instead of immediately jumping into action, they lie for a few minutes, reflect, and get ready to go into action. Using one technique is also a mistake. Instead of alternating and cycling techniques, since different ones might work on different days, somebody might pick one technique, since it seems to him it's the best one. As a rule, during our attempts, one or several of the mistakes on the list were there. As soon as you fix them, your success rate will be high, even if you poorly understand all the rest. When a person doesn't realize they're making mistakes, even though they're fudging everything and making a ton of mistakes, it often seems to them they're doing everything right. They naturally start to look for external factors. For example, it turns out that some astral beings won't let them out. The bed is facing the wrong way. They eat lots of meat, or it's not the right phase of the moon. I've also heard, you need to take off all your gold. Good thing I didn't hear that yesterday. Some wise guy on Channel One once said to never, ever enter the astral plane in windy weather or from an airplane. <laughs> You'll be gone with the wind, he said. I've been on a lot of Channel One shows. I can tell you that you can't take Channel One or Two seriously when the show's about this topic. There were cases when shows on national networks ended with the presenters shouting, Hooray! We've just fooled millions again. <laughs> I won't be naming names so as not to disillusion you. I'll tell you my funniest story when it comes to do's and don'ts. I'm a super patient guy. It's practically impossible to get me to lose my cool. But once there was this case when I lost my patience right at the seminar. We had two groups of 40 people. Earlier I had spoken with everybody one-on-one, -on -one, and so I was really tired. I'm talking with an elderly gentleman. And when it was his turn, I asked him, what did you do? He started telling me what he did. You know the instructions. But for some reason, he lay down during the day and started doing something, so he just lay down during the day and his actions had nothing to do with what I had assigned. He simply lay down and did his own thing, and he talks about how nothing worked for him. Right then, I started shaking. Why did this guy even come here? And what did he do all that for? He says, it didn't work for me, but I figured out why that happened. I rejoiced and thought he would say, I should have done what everybody else did. After all, everything worked okay for others, but no. You know what he said? After the attempt, he found an amulet under the bed that he had de-energized, and that's why nothing worked for him. That was the only time since 2007 that I lost my temper at a seminar and started yelling. For example, you enter the phase five times one night. One or two of them will be wishy-washy, brief, and not deepened. That's absolutely normal. I squeeze the phase out of every awakening. Sometimes, naturally, I'm not fully ready physiologically, and I still squeeze out a phase. And that's why, when I squeeze the phase out of nothing, it might be brief and not fully deepened. Although I would get a phase experience, in as much as my body was not totally ready, it would be brief, not deepened, and so on. But in most cases, naturally, the phases are normal ones. However, you should be ready for not all phases being deep and long, which is normal too. You gain experience by having more experiences. It also happens to me that I wake up and it seems to me that I'm lying in bed, that I'm already in reality, that I've already awoken, and that I'm simply lying down. At such moments, you don't even feel like trying because it's as if you've woken up completely. Yesterday, I talked about what I do in that situation. I start practicing. I think, okay, I'll simply practice a bit as if I had a normal awakening. You start to practice and it starts to work. So, you made attempts, and whether or not it worked, 
You want to discuss those attempts. Igor is helping Augusta. I'll now show you the procedure you can use to find what got in the way, where you tripped up. The procedure. What's the first thing to do? What might the first task be? Just make an attempt. It might seem obvious, but as we talked about yesterday, not everyone is able to get around to an attempt. Did we get around to an attempt? Yes. Objective one complete. Got around to an attempt. During an attempt, we have the objective, say, when cycling techniques, of achieving what? Augusta cycled techniques. What was her main goal? In cycling techniques, to find a technique that works. Find a technique that works. A technique starting to work. By starting to work, I mean both separation and the mirror and the techniques themselves all together. That's all a technique beginning to work. You need to get a technique to start to work. Igor, tell me. A technique starting to work. What is that already? A technique starting to work. That's the phase. That's already the phase. That is, if you've reached step two, you're already in the phase. After that, what do we have? Separation. Yes, there's separation. After separation, what do we have? Maintaining. Deepening. Deepening together with what? With maintaining. And with what else? Deepening together with the plan of action. That is, items four and five are at the same time. Deepening. And the plan of action after deepening goes with what else? With maintaining. With maintaining. What's the most important part of maintaining we're singling out? Secondary exit. So, Augusta does have an attempt. Next, she starts cycling techniques. And now when analyzing, it's very important to find out whether it came to any techniques starting to work. There's another interesting thing that you should simply beat into your head. Igor, say I lie down now and will be doing techniques. If I suddenly get the sensation that I don't feel my body, does that indicate anything? It indicates you're in the phase state. If I lie down right now, right now? Yes, I lie down and in literally a few minutes, I get the sensation that I don't feel my body. Does that indicate anything? No. Most likely it doesn't mean anything. Today, we'll be going through the direct techniques, and you'll see why it doesn't mean anything. But if I woke up and got the sensation at some point that my body wasn't there, then it's the phase. Then it's the phase. If I lie down now, or I'm even sitting in a chair, and images appear before my eyes, does that mean anything? No. Right, that doesn't mean anything either. But if I wake up and see an image, yes, I'm in the phase. It's the same with noises, vibrations, or any sensations. What's the point? If you wake up and get any unusual sensation, that always clearly indicates that you're in the phase. And so Augusta simply felt that she didn't feel her body. Look, what's at the heart of this procedure? The light bulb goes off for us at point two. A technique starts working, not feeling the body. That's the phase two. It's better to put any sensations here and the light bulb goes off for us. It's a sign that we've crossed the threshold. At this point, we're already in the phase. And what issue arises for us here? Separation, right. And now we need to figure out where Augusta's problem is. I've realized my problems. All right, tell us about them in more detail. I turned on my analytical mind. What's the simplest question to ask Augusta in this case? Did you even try to separate right then? Yes, that is, you nevertheless tried to separate. Yes, I was in bed, turned around, and tried to push off the couch. Do I understand correctly that you started to rotate and some sensations arose? Yes. And when you started pushing off with your hands, you were turned back? Yeah, yeah. It's as if the glass started to pour over, but you poured yourself back. What we've just discussed is a key point for your future self-analysis. For example, Augusta comes and says, nothing worked for me. First of all, this isn't going into the statistics, obviously. And so Augusta says, nothing worked. We're starting to go through what happened to her step by step. At some point, we suddenly see the start of sensations, and upon awakening, that's already the phase. That is, as soon as a technique started to work, some sensations arose. That's it. Case closed. Here's our next issue. Separation. 
And so where did it turn out Augusta ran into a problem? During separation? During separation. What exactly wasn't done right? Too much analysis, which returned her sensations to the bed. Yes, okay, even Augusta admitted she didn't have paralysis. She thinks, how can you enter the phase without paralysis? Something's not right. That item was even on the list of typical mistakes, not recognizing the phase intellectually. This is just such a case. Our theoretical knowledge does not allow us to understand what's happening to us. Good, besides the analysis. Augusta, you tried to turn, but you weren't quite able to. That's why you tried to engage your hands and feel your body. At that moment, what needed to be done next? At that moment, it was necessary to proceed to carrying out the plan of action to separate all the way. And how else was it also possible to try to separate? To change the direction of the movement. And what else did you try? Did you try to separate again? No, I decided to go to bed. Don't make that mistake again in the future. You had just had a sign of the phase. Separation even worked halfway for you. You even turned. And meanwhile, you think, ah, well, okay, next time. I'll ruin Michael's statistics. Let him suffer. <laughs> of course, I'm joking. But the point is that you up and gave up. There was no aggression. Not even aggression, but perseverance. I think that in life, the most important factor for success in any matter is to have perseverance. To never give up. Not when it comes to trifles, but the most important things. You're practicing the phase. And the phase did come to you. And separation even started. But there was a small misfire somewhere, and you up and gave up. Instead of continuing techniques, or simply trying to rotate again, or trying another technique. That is, the biggest mistake here, in this specific case, was when Augusta did what? She simply gave up. What's the point of deepening we talked about yesterday? The fact is, you wake up somewhere here. But in terms of sensations, it seems to you that you're lying here. It turns out you're already in the phase, but the phase is so weak that you don't even feel it. But if we're in the phase, let's do deepening right away. You start to imagine you're deepening, you touch everything, and the result is you enter the phase. Separation can also be used. By the way, they wrote on your Facebook group that you shouldn't have sex. <laughs> We've been infiltrated. Is that also related to energy, or is that all not true? It seems to me that food and sex are just small stuff. Well, they're clearly not just small stuff. Who needs the phase when you have that? No, it doesn't get in the way that much. For some, maybe it gets in the way. But why deprive life of its richness? Everything should be harmonious and natural. That's the main rule in life. Everything in life should be harmonious. You shouldn't be hard on yourself. I woke up at 6.45 a.m. to my alarm clock, went to eat, brushed my teeth, went to the bathroom, and then sat down and went through what we did at the lesson. That is, I ran through successful and unsuccessful attempts, the whole procedure. Then I lay down and fell asleep. For some time, I was unable to fall asleep. Then I fell into a half-awake state, and then fell asleep. As soon as I woke up, I tried to imagine myself at the mirror, but nothing worked out for me. I tried to continue on with the attempts. I made an attempt to separate and fell asleep immediately. I woke up in approximately a few seconds, remembered about the technique, and immediately felt the hands that were folded before my eyes. I knew for a fact that those hands weren't my physical ones. I knew for a fact it was tactile sensations that belonged to the phase. I simply started standing up after my hands and reached out after that sensation. I then got the impression that they were nevertheless my physical hands. There was no analysis, but the sensations were so real that, as a matter of fact, they tricked me. I lay back down. Afterwards, I automatically made an attempt to separate using deepening. That is, I imagined myself at the door, palpating it. My sensations immediately switched over to me feeling the door. The sensations were very realistic, but sight was lacking. The sensations were so real that I simply doubted that I hadn't gotten up. But I remembered in time that I hadn't gotten up. I follow the rule that if it seems to me that it's real, then I still continue to act as if I were in the phase. 
on the assumption that even if it were real, the worst that could happen is that I open my eyes and I'm in the hallway. The main thing is not to jump out the window yelling, yay, I'm on the astral plane. I continued on. I was returned back to my body, and I felt my body again. I felt my hands. I again pictured myself right before the mirror, and saw myself standing before the mirror. That is, I saw the mirror, and saw my reflection in it. I started palpating the mirror, and sight came almost instantly. I continued to palpate the surface of the mirror, continued to feel about the corners, and began to see my own reflection, which was completely the same as in real life. I figured the first plan of action was completed. Then I remembered that I wanted to experiment, to see how much the mirror reflected reality. I was practically the same, but my facial features were more chiseled. I figured I looked like a vampire somehow, and so I decided to change my eye color. As soon as I thought it, my eyes became black, and then red. That made me happy, and I thought, great simulation. And I thought, that's it. Time to go on to the next action item. I went to the kitchen. Who's in the kitchen? My grandma, who's dead. Was she supposed to have been there? No. Dead or deceased? My late grandma. Sorry. No big deal. In that apartment, I'm used to my grandma usually being in the kitchen. She died a few years ago, and I saw her. I perceived that as one of the manifestations of the phase, and thought, well, grandma is grandma. I told her hello, and went on. I went out the front door, and then went down. And that's when I realized I had reached the main entrance. The lock on the door got in my way, and I figured I wouldn't open it. I simply pulled it off, and continued down the stairs. I went outside. I noticed it was a sunny day. But the landscape was a bit different. It didn't correspond to reality. That didn't bother me at all. Then I saw a group of people standing around, and I realized that I shouldn't have left the kitchen because the next item on the plan of action was to eat something. I figured I needed to handle the situation and began looking for what could have been done in the street. And that's when I saw a young lady with a friend who was drinking mineral water. I went up and said, give me your bottle. She gave me her bottle and I tried it. And while my sense of taste had been a bit dull in my previous attempt, or everything even tasted bitter, now my sense of taste was very distinct. Meanwhile, I didn't have a subsequent plan of action, none at all. I had two items. I wasn't sure about the third, personal plan, and so I just continued on. And since I didn't have a third item on my plan, I immediately returned to my body. That is, I returned and felt myself lying in my body. Afterwards, I made a second attempt to separate, and it didn't work for me. I simply continued sleeping. Then, I woke back up. I tried for about a minute, but then I realized that nothing at all would work that day, since I was already really tired. I nevertheless was still really sleep-deprived, and I just decided to stop, since it was 10.30. I had to get up in order to get ready to come here. I'd like to bring your attention to the following. Say Augusta had an experience yesterday, but didn't today. And Igor didn't have an experience yesterday, but did today. That goes to show that not all days are alike. Different techniques might work for you. It might happen in all kinds of ways. Raise your hand if your attempts yesterday and today were different. In terms of quality, in terms of results, in terms of everything. You see, it's normal. So on these two days, never draw conclusions. I felt my hands and started analyzing whether those hands were real. Actually, that's a very frequent problem. In fact, it's not a problem, but it happens that you try to see your hands. They appear, you see them, look at them, and think, gosh, what did I put my hands up for? Again, that's being unprepared for the sensations being real. As a matter of fact, you're exactly the same in the phase as you are here and now. That's why there's no need to wait for some unusual astral body with wings or whatever else. I knew this one guy. Actually, I knew him many years. We would always talk in groups and discuss things. Once the topic came up of how to figure out if you're in the phase or not, he says, it's easy. In the phase, you always have six fingers on each hand. Everybody looks at him. How's that? He indeed always had six fingers there. Actually, it's an interesting experiment with changed anatomy. You feel all those fingers and control them all. There might even be six or seven of them. Every time you're returned from the phase, treat it as a new awakening. 
Think about it from a purely logical point of view. Even if the phase really had ended, it was just there. That's why you need to try again either way. In most cases, it just seemed to you that the phase had finished. This one lady once worked with us. At the seminar, she talked about how she entered the kitchen and searched around it. But there was nothing there. All the shelves were empty. And she opens a drawer, and there are two rotten tomatoes inside. She sees they're spoiled, moldy, and smell bad. But the plan must be carried out. Have to eat. And that's the only case I've heard of when someone tried to have a bite to eat, but vomited in the phase. Another case, a lady told me she was walking in the forest. The plan was to eat something and look in the mirror. And suddenly, she saw a mirrored flower, that is, a flower made of mirrored glass. First, she goes up and sees her reflection, and then starts to eat the glass. Most interestingly, she said she really felt how the glass crunched in her mouth. But meanwhile, she found it pleasant. That is, she eats the glass, chews it, swallows, and feels it all, but found it pleasant. Let's return to how taste, food, satiation, and so on are all related in reality, relatively speaking. In the phase, it can all happen in different ways. First, Andre will help Tatiana. I came home in the evening, went through my entire plan in my head, set my alarm for 5.55, and went to sleep with a clear mind. That is, I made no attempts before the alarm clock. The alarm went off, and I went to the bathroom, came back, lay down, and began trying to fall asleep. That is, I began to do forced falling asleep. Overall, I have problems with that. If I wake up, I can't fall back asleep. That's why I stopped walking, eating, and so on at night. And here I had to try. I'm falling asleep, but it doesn't work. And a struggle started to happen while I'm trying to fall asleep. At some point, it apparently happened. I feel I've begun wiggling. And I say, there it is. And with that going on, I was ejected. I was ejected and I flew. I flew and understood I needed to go to the mirror. I fly up to the mirror and realize I need to eat. I realize I don't have any time and fly on. Then I realize I need to deepen. But to deepen while in flight? I began picking up sticks. I don't know if I picked them up from the ground or somewhere else. That is, I picked up an armful of them. I had a feeling of satisfaction that it worked, that I had deepened. With that armful, I landed back in my body. That was my first experience, and so I was happy. But the plan, of course, had not been carried out. I deliberately flew through the mirror, but didn't manage to eat. Although that was in the plan. But why didn't you manage to do it? I was flying. I was going really fast. I think picking up sticks is great. That is, you felt it, right? Of course. Afterwards, you still needed to decide where you were going. Maybe going to the mirror or something else, so there would have been a goal. What does it mean that Tatiana got that sensation without even falling asleep? Not even according to procedure, as it were. She got the sensation and realized right then something was happening. She thought she would then roll out of her body, but instead she suddenly started flying, though not of her own free will. What does the fact that flight happened indicate? She dragged out the attempt and was ejected. It was already a long time for you to separate and so on. But since you were lying down in the phase, you were simply lucky that the phase kicked you out on its own. But you might not have been so lucky and you'd have continued wiggling. How to separate without having made physical movements? Many are afraid to do separation because they're afraid to make a physical movement, and that ruins everything. What things and tools are there for separating when you're guaranteed not to move physically? Levitation. Say levitation. Right. That is, for levitation, you don't tense muscles, right? Falling out. Falling out. What else? Immediately imagine yourself separated somewhere. Immediately appear there. Feel the sensation of flight. If there are images, you can enter them. Last question for Andre. Was that the direct or indirect method? It was probably the direct method. That's what we'll be going through today. Why? Because she didn't make an attempt upon awakening. Yes, she was lying down and everything happened inadvertently. This time, I followed the advice. I was told to sleep less and not six hours. I set my alarm to get about four and a half hours sleep. I wake up. I decided to use the restroom. 
I went to the bathroom. I didn't eat this time, so as to keep it as short as possible. I went back to bed. I remembered what I needed to do. Then I think, I won't be thinking about what I need to do. Otherwise, I won't be able to fall back asleep. I fall asleep, wake up, and immediately go to the mirror. I try to go to the mirror, but realize it was me having thoughts about the mirror. I start to do techniques for levitation, for all kinds of spinning and for swimming. I cycled through a few times. Doesn't help. Well, I think, wasn't meant to be. I fall asleep. Wake up after some time and go back to the mirror. I realize going to the mirror isn't happening for me. I start to do those techniques. I cycle through them again. It didn't work for me again. I feel that I'm still here. I fall asleep. Then after some time, I wake up. I realize that if I don't do something differently this time, I won't get to the mirror. I immediately start to cycle through the techniques. And I went through three or four. Until then, it had been more, five or six. It didn't work again. I fall asleep again, wake up again, and do two or three techniques again. I then fall back asleep and fall into a dream, but it's already an ordinary dream. Okay, first before looking for what got in the way, I would like to say that yesterday, there weren't any attempts at all, right? There being attempts, when they're there, that's already what's most important. What remained was to make adjustments, corrections. What's most important is cranking out attempts. Well, there were full-fledged awakenings. That's most important. What remained was to improve upon some matters of technique. Could I make a clarification? I lie in bed with my wife. I pushed her away a bit so she wouldn't get in the way. So nobody physically bothered me. Look, for the deferred method, some people even go to another room to sleep, to another place to lie down, so nobody gets in their way. They also give everyone a heads up, turn off their phones, and so on. You can do it that way. Meanwhile, some do it the opposite way. A good example is with small children. Somebody once said, I now have a small child. It won't let me sleep. Meanwhile, some say that their baby is constantly waking up, moving, and always giving them awakenings as a result. It all depends on your attitude. Okay. The techniques aren't working. Tatiana, what's to be done in that situation? Yesterday, one of the main pieces of advice we discussed was to do it as if falling asleep. Have you tried it? It's as if I'm doing the hands visualization technique, and as if it's not a phase entrance technique, but a technique for falling asleep. I start doing it, and I try to fall asleep at the same time, and in literally a few seconds, my hands appear. Any technique will start to work when you do it as if falling asleep if it hadn't worked when done with intensity and aggression. I also compared myself lying down or awake. Thanks to his analysis, he doesn't concentrate on his actions. Look, you have your internal powers, which you can apply either to your actions or to thinking it over. And if you start analyzing, and this is especially relevant for men, then your mind will be unfocused. That is, if you're analyzing, you're doing the techniques wrong. Right. You're doing the technique, but doing it isn't enough here. It's especially important here to put your all into the result. You should do the technique as if trying to dive into it. You shouldn't get stuck on analysis. It's running in the background, it's there just a bit, but you're fully in the moment. Your all goes into it. You simply dive into the technique, and you try no matter what to feel the results. For example, you sit in a car and immediately try to drive off without starting it up. You pull the, the steering wheel, but it doesn't turn and the pedals don't work because you have to start up the car. That diving into the technique fires up the engine. Then the car will start moving. Yaroslav, Andre, and Irina. As soon as I started to fall asleep, I decided to try forced falling asleep. I'm really good at making myself fall asleep. I used forced falling asleep. I had a goal. The thing is, when analyzing yesterday's attempts, I realized that I thought quite a lot. For example, yesterday I thought, right, I saw a mirror, a rear view mirror. Everything I saw, I analyzed. I didn't just analyze, I did it out loud. That's why I couldn't go any further. And this time, I made myself fall asleep. As soon as I realize that just a bit more and I'll fall asleep, I immediately appear at the mirror. While I don't see anything, 
I know I'm at the mirror, because I know you need to eat. But I don't know what to eat, because I don't have anything at home besides candy. My second plan immediately comes to mind. I should go to my goal. I appear at my goal. I immediately appear where I wanted to go. I had the very firm intention of watching my first experience. I was 10 years old then, and I only remember the feeling of fear, this mortal terror. I had this awful feeling and a single question, who am I? I carried that fear inside me for 20 years until I found out there are seminars like this, and there's Michael Raduga, who can teach it. Because I dabbled in a lot of everything, meditation and various practices, but I couldn't return to that state. I couldn't even find hints of that state. It wasn't described anywhere. And here I am in this room, and I see it with 30% realism. Everything's blurry. I see myself in bed, and I suddenly feel what I had felt. Fear? No, I don't feel fear. I knew I had felt fear. I had a question. Why had I woken up with my neck stuck in one position and not been able to move my head for months? I was like this. I wanted to see everything all over again in order to understand what had actually happened, because all I remember was fear. Did you see that scene from the outside? I saw myself from the outside, but I felt everything that had been inside. It was as if I weren't lying on the bed. I saw myself standing in the room. That is, you see the situation, but feel yourself lying in bed? Yes, inside. I'm lying and realize the doorbell's ringing. I came to. And I feel myself outside my body. I don't see anything. It's dark, and it's the same feeling of fear. Excuse me, that is, you had already left the situation. No, I'm there. I'm saying that I see everything, as it were, that I feel inside myself. I understand I'm outside my body, but I don't know who I am. I hear the doorbell ringing. I realize I need to get up and open it. But I can't move. I can't get up. I can't do anything. That lasted a few seconds, this awful feeling of fear. What's happening? What's with me? What happened? And then, I realize I feel it that I started to move spasmodically. And I rolled out of the bed together with my physical body. And my head stayed like this. I rolled out, and my head couldn't move. In that state, I went to open the door. Your head really wouldn't move. Really. It wouldn't move afterwards. I even have childhood photos where I'm 10 years old. It happened in the fall, when it would get dark early. And then when New Year's came on our family photo, I'm standing like this, with toys. You know, there were those ostriches, they would move. I had this ostrich and I was like this. Never heard of anything like that. Now I understand what happened that night. As soon as I had realized all that, I began to analyze and left that state right then. I returned and found myself in bed. I realized I know what in fact happened, why I had a head like that. That is, I couldn't move. And then we discussed how there's paralysis. Well, I was in that paralysis, and when I started trying to do something, I rolled right out of it. Apparently some paralysis-related condition had occurred. I analyzed everything. I then tried to return there. And as soon as I realized I was back at the mirror, I returned to that situation. I wanted to analyze everything again, but suddenly fell asleep, and I left that state again. I analyzed it all again, and then made myself fall asleep. Let me tell you a secret. Many ask, but why the mirror? So you'll be curious what's in the mirror. It's a relatively simple goal that's not too difficult, and you have motivation to do something. Tell you to set your own goals, and you won't do anything. Many even suspect that a cult initiation takes place through a mirror. One of our seminars was even ruined over that. A lady traveled from St. Petersburg and really ruined a seminar. At the first lesson, I spoke about the mirror and she jumped right in. Michael, what do you mean? That's the most dangerous thing you can do. All the books say so. 
What do you want to do to us? You're sending us to our deaths. It's that dangerous. I had a friend in the group. And later he told me what people talked about behind my back. It turned out that at the second or third lesson, almost all the group didn't try because they were afraid. And that lady never showed up again. She spread her virus and never came back. People were truly afraid to try. If you have a goal of your own, you go towards it. In this case, Irina did right. I got home late because I had gotten lost in the metro. I got home at three and went right to bed. Once again, I got these thoughts. That I'm going to bed late and nothing will work. I hardly slept, although I wanted to sleep. I woke up the next morning and immediately think I need to at least wake myself up somehow. I decided to do what we repeated yesterday. I walked around, decided to deepen, carry out my plan of action in reality, and touch everything, to do some techniques some more. I rehearsed how I would go into action. I even opened the refrigerator so as to wake myself up at least a little. Then I lay down. I had trouble falling asleep. I wasn't able to fall asleep for a long time. After some time, I thought, I would ruin all the statistics again and nothing would work. And then I wake up and immediately try to do everything calmly. Then I realize that separation isn't working for me. For some reason, I immediately started to do separation. I had done attempts at separation before, but they never worked. Then I was saved by the mirror again. Michael suggested the technique, and it starts helping me a bit. I try to imagine him at the mirror. And separation suddenly works, but I don't appear at the mirror immediately. And for some reason, I get up and go to the mirror and appear there. But for some reason, simply separating doesn't work, and I imagined myself at the mirror. And separation works on its own. I stand up and go to the mirror. But do you stand up directly in terms of sensation? Yes, I stand up in terms of sensation. And it's easy to stand up. I go up to the mirror and start to touch everything. Meanwhile, I remembered the deepening techniques, which were yesterday. Everything feels vague at first. And I remembered what was most important. Until then, the deepening techniques hadn't worked for me at all. I remembered about feeling in. Not just palpation, but feeling in. And that feeling in helped. I tried to feel in. All those details, I tried to touch everything. And feel fine details. Peering in, I started peering right in, into everything, but quickly. And vividness did increase. Up to 75% maybe. And that's a lot for me because sometimes it was even at 40%. I did deepening completely. And then I had the mirror according to plan. I looked back in the mirror. I didn't see myself in it. I went to the refrigerator since I had to eat something. For some reason, I wanted to find red caviar of some sort and eat it. I open it and there's fish paste there. Gross, are you kidding me? I close the can right away. I figure I'll put it back and take another can. I close the refrigerator. And then I open it and there's that fish paste again. I think, a curse or something? I open it again and it's the same thing. What the heck? I gave up on the refrigerator. That was it, enough. I didn't even manage to drink juices. I was fed up already. Then I had my personal goal. I also decided to do everything, like last time. Michael said we're doing everything the same, the personal goal too. I decided to find the very same goal, this lady who I wasn't able to meet yesterday. For some reason, with this goal, it turns out that I just start looking for her. I turn around and there's nobody there. I also tried to open the door and find her that way. No luck either. On the third action, I was thrown back out. Once everything was over, I made a secondary exit. I made the secondary exit and the same thing again, the mirror and the rest. Did it work? Yes, it worked. Meanwhile, I made a secondary exit several times because I was thrown out at my personal goal each time. And there was suddenly this spacing out and I appeared in a completely different place in another space on some square where there was some market. And I think, uh-huh, now everyone will say it was some dream, as it were. And right then I thought, you mean the people in the room? Yeah, yeah. I was slick and figured, I'll do a deepening technique now. So there's no doubt, right. 
That's why I did a deepening technique. I started touching all the fences in my arms. I did peering in. Realism also increased for me. I left and immediately remembered there were problems with flight here yesterday. Somebody wasn't able to fly yesterday. There were problems. I figure I'll at least try to levitate myself. Maybe it'll work. Bottom line, I flew and then remembered it hadn't worked for anyone. My resolution had worked. It shouldn't have worked, as it were. Oh, how I dropped. How I crashed to the earth. I felt real pain. I fell and I was in real pain. Suddenly I hear Michael's voice in my left ear. We are conducting supernatural experiments. There's a square house there, a rectangular one. Michael whispers something in my ear. Levitate, levitate. I'm levitating and everything there is covered in barbed wire. I climbed and felt real pain when I touched the barbed wire. After all, I had levitated and fell on it. Everything was under occupation. Further on, there were barbed wire fences and we went through it all. You had to go through all the levels there. I'm in pain. I got caught on that barbed wire. Maybe there was even some blood. I couldn't see if there was. I was in real pain. I thought, how did they even get in here? I'm not going there. I'm in real pain. Some computer games were already taking place there. Has anyone played Counter-Strike or Half-Life? Some bots and special forces were running around, all shooting. I picked up an Uzi and also started shooting at those bots. Then I jumped out of there and think, no way in hell I'm going there. I jumped out, but it was a light jump through a window, like in Counter-Strike. I picked up an M16. I ran there and started kicking everyone around. It was already a dream at the point. In my opinion, those actions were unconscious. Because it was already nonsense at that point. Okay, Irina, at what point did the phase end? It seems to me that the phase ended when he lost sight of his goal. When he appeared on the square, then he flew off, and then it was some fantasy. But in what exact place? Let's do it together. What ideas does Andre have? Maybe when those games appeared, that was already more like a dream. When he got sucked into the episode? For as long as he induced the actions on his own, he remained conscious. Why? I knew I wanted to levitate, to try. No, no, during the levitation, it was still okay. And then in that room with the barbed wire, you were sucked into the dream episode and the game. In the process, you most likely fell asleep. Did you find the can of caviar in the refrigerator easily? Yes. But finding the caviar itself was a problem. A bunch of other people appeared on the square. Even I appeared somewhere there. But the right person didn't appear, so confidence was lacking somewhere. Now, Andre, tell us about it. I'll try to be quick to only tell you about the key points. I set my alarm for 6 a.m., I woke up at about 4, and immediately tried to do something. It didn't work for me. I looked at my watch and drank water, but didn't get up. And then there was more sleep. I woke up later to the alarm clock at 6 a.m. I won't be talking about my unsuccessful attempts. My successful attempt was as follows. I try to imagine myself at the mirror, using force falling asleep in parallel. I began to see the mirror. I try to feel it, but something's not right. I see that the mirror is steamy and start to rub it. I even hear how the glass squeaks. I start wiping it and see the joker in the reflection, the one from the movies. I think, oh, I'm in the phase. And you're the joker? No, not me. In the reflection in the mirror, he's behind me. He's standing and smiling or something like that. I figure I'll verify if I'm in the phase or not. I close my nose and breathe. It works. Now I need to go eat. I turn around, but the joker's already gone. I went to the kitchen and make another protein shake. I start mixing everything. I turn around halfway, and there's this figure standing there in white. She looks like a ghost or something. A character from another film? Well, she looks at me with these languishing eyes, and I fly off and return to my body. But I had fully thought out my entire plan down to the last detail, which is what was missing last time. 
I think, well, okay, I need to exit again right now. I try again, the mirror, it doesn't work out. I rub my hands and think, oh, let me combine it. I'll still imagine I'm walking, rubbing my hands and walking in Paris. Once the streets of Paris start to appear, I think, stop. Why Paris? I want to go to London. Now Igor from Paris will be offended. London starts to appear, then shoot. I think I want to go to America after all. Basically, three different streets appeared. Ones I had been in, I looked at them and returned. Actually, while walking and rubbing my hands at the same time, I also did forced falling asleep in parallel. Andre wasn't making his way toward a specific task, but easily appeared where he wanted to. What does it mean when a person has quick translocation? Fast translocation means there isn't a high level of realism. Let's ask. How realistic was it? Yes, in fact, during secondary exit, it wasn't all that high a level of realism. And if you put it in percentage terms, probably about 50 to 60 percent. And the first time? The first time, hyperrealism occurred immediately after the Joker appeared. But actually, I left something out. When I was above the mirror, I saw him in the reflection. But then I started to lower and saw myself in the reflection, and it wasn't me. That is, it was me, but this entity didn't look at all like me. It was even a bit scary, though interesting. How do we avoid the appearance of entities who interfere? As soon as you stop paying attention to them, they disappear. If you pay attention to them, they will appear behind you all the time, and so on. That's the iron law of the phase. If you run away from something, then it will immediately run after you up until you stop paying attention to it. Let's collect some statistics. Meanwhile, I won't be asking anyone for details. In order to save time, raise your hand if you slept today, had a dream, and realized it was a dream while in it. Raise your hand if you had dream consciousness. Raise your hand if you woke up and were immediately able to appear at the mirror. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Who was able to appear at the mirror immediately twice? Three times? Raise your hand if you were able, if being at the mirror didn't work out and you immediately tried to separate by levitating, who was able to levitate? Who was able to roll out, to enter the phase by rolling out? Who was able to simply stand up? Raise your hand if you entered the phase by standing up. Raise your hand if, using rotation, you were able to enter a full-fledged phase. Raise your hand if you were able to use the swimming technique to enter the phase. You imagined you were swimming and suddenly appeared in some place. Does walking count? We'll put that in other. Raise your hand if you were able to use hand visualization to appear in the phase. Raise your hand if you were able to using deepening. You imagined you were in a room and then really appeared in it, already in the phase. One, two, three, four, five, six. Raise your hand if you accomplished at least one previously set task. One, two, three, eleven. Before the break, I'd like to say a few words about statistics. First, deepening was the star of the show today. Generally speaking, it's not the best as a technique, but it's one of the best for sure, based on practitioner testimonials and even pure logic. Look, sometimes it pains me that deepening isn't always the star of the show. It's hard to explain. But when we wake up, we're already in the phase. That is, we should immediately appear at our goal, which is what we're trying to do. Look at how going to the mirror immediately is leading the pack, or immediately deepening, since we're in the phase. We should enter the phase, separate, and deepen while carrying out our plan. But why not start deepening right away if we appear in the phase immediately? For that very reason, this technique should work very well for you. Here, I gave you techniques that can easily be explained. For example, there isn't even any phantom wiggling here, because it takes a lot of time to explain. I don't want to take time away from anything else. But meanwhile, don't forget that we haven't counted cases when you entered the phase only halfway. Actually, we didn't even count when a person is lying down in the phase. We didn't count hazy phases either. Actually, there were about twice as many experiences. 
That is, you enter the phase easily and in a simple manner, in fact. We've tried to count realized phases when you've at least stood up, gone somewhere, and started doing something. Unrealized phases are much greater in number, and your task in subsequent individual practice is to increase your percentage of realized experiences. So our first task is to influence physiology. You might call it self-healing. It's one of the most promising fields, but a little studied one, and it should be seen as a supplemental method for having an influence. You can't cure a case of appendicitis in the phase. The phase is seen as a supplemental method for having an influence. If you have a problem of some kind, all of your hopes should never be put in the phase. It simply won't help with everything, and much more depends on the way that you do it. More on that later. First, we'll discuss possible methods, and then we'll talk about why it works out of the blue. Based on what we've already discussed, how can we have an influence on ourselves, on our bodies, in the phase? Pills, tablets, taking medicine. What's the most important when taking medicine? Feeling yourself as being well. Yes, to immediately feel the effect you need. The medicine might be a tablet. What else might it be? A liquid, a liquid, pill or potion, all the way up to injections. The elixir of life. What? Elixirs, ointments and injections, any type of medicine. What's most important is to immediately feel the effect you need from it. Direct influence, that is, you immediately imagine yourself as being well. Here, medicine can be compared to obtaining information from an object. You can obtain information directly, and it's the same here. You need medicine because you're used to it. However, the effect can be directly obtained, but I'll tell you why it's possible a bit later. Out of what we've already discussed, what also applies to influencing the physiology? We've discussed it. It also goes here. Diagnostics, let's say. But what do diagnostics fall under? Obtaining information, yes, obtaining information. What we discussed yesterday in the context of obtaining information is all applicable in the context of healing. What can we find out? A diagnosis, diagnostics for ourselves or another person, plus methods for healing. But healing where? Both here and there, both here and there. We can find it all out using techniques for obtaining information. And for another person too? You can find out, but not have a direct influence on them. That's what I'm saying. That's the only proven way, and I'd like to emphasize the word proven. To help any person, to find out how to help them. Some believe that you can have a direct influence, but I personally don't have any evidence for that. What else can you do? Any ideas? Sports activities. If it's good for the health in real life, the same activity will be beneficial in the phase, for example, sports or something else. That is, beneficial experiences need to be repeated in the phase. A doctor's appointment. Say you can use the phase, but don't know exactly what to do. It's just like in reality. You don't know what to do and go to the doctors, and they'll go through all kinds of procedures up to operations. Who knows what the problem will be with a doctor's appointment? Believability. Long line. Problems with maintaining, while you go up to the window and scrutinize the neighborhood, the phase might end. It's the same with communicating with an object. You stop and think, you're not doing anything, and the phase might end. Directly operating on yourself, for example, cutting something out. Direct influence. We up and have a direct influence using any method. Generally speaking, there's a cure-all in the phase. It comes in all forms. It helps with everything. It's called phase wrong. <laughs> Ointments, tablets, and devices are also forms of phase wrong. So you're the one who makes it there. Maybe if there's some speech impediment, then you can get confidence in the phase. OK, what does that fall under then? We're talking about physical illnesses right now, but what does that fall under? Under psychology under psychology. Andre talked about a communication habit, that is, complexes of some type. In this case, you enter the needed environment and rehearse. Do you have some kind of fear in real life, a phobia? The phase is an awesome beachhead for confronting your fears and dealing with them. In the phase, there are the same fears as here and they're intensified there. As soon as you encounter the fear there, you'll deal with it. As a rule, it's enough to look your fear in the eye to realize what you're afraid of is yourself. Practicing skills. Now we'll be discussing 
How come this all works? How come this all works? In fact, that's quite an interesting topic. I'm often asked what I do there, what my efforts are concentrated on. In fact, one of my main fields is studying influence on the physiology, certain aspects of it. I won't even be speaking about them here. However, I think this is the field with the greatest potential and the most significance in terms of development of the phenomenon itself and attitudes toward it in society. Though this topic is quite poorly understood, and there are quite a number of interesting topics, that's not the point. Let's talk about how come all this might work, why actions in the phase might impact reality. I'd like to touch upon a few points here. First, we'll start from practicing skills. What happens in real life when I raise my hand? We imagine, for example, groups of neurons, entire networks. For simplicity's sake, let's say that to raise your hand, you need to activate this neuron or group of neurons, and this one. Meanwhile, I've never raised my hand before in my life, let's say. When I do some action for the first time, that is, I raise my hand for the first time in my life, Remember when you did some learned behavior for the first time and everything happened hesitatingly? That's because there was no direct connection. And the connection took place through intermediaries. When you start to raise this hand often, that's how the learned behavior is practiced. Note that the connection arising is a physical process in the brain. First it starts to shorten to the shortest distance possible and literally thickens like a muscle. That is, the shortest possible path is beaten, and a real thickening of those connections occurs, absolutely for real. If it isn't used, then it atrophies like a muscle. It's an absolutely fluid process. Has anyone heard the term connectome? There's the human genome, and then there's the human connectome. Scientists were once awarded a large grant to completely map the connections in the human brain. Who knows why their grant was revoked? and their grandiose project was halted because it constantly changes. Yes, because it constantly changes. It turned out there's no point in drawing that map because it's absolutely fluid. In primitive life forms and worms, the connectome was mapped a long time ago. A worm only has a few hundred neurons. In humans, if you put all the connected neurons in a straight line, it would stretch to the sun and back several times. It's very hard work. All the more so when it's all changing, and it's changing because we're always using one and not using another. And all those connections are constantly changing. That is, it's not an instant process, but a gradual one. So what's the point? The point is that when I raise my hand in the phase from one point of view of the same neurons, I'm doing everything absolutely the same. Whether I'm raising my hand now or raising it in the phase, it's one and the same neurons firing. I won't be going into details, but the bottom line is that those signals don't reach the body. That is, at the oldest parts of the brain, the medulla, the signals are blocked and don't go through. In wakefulness and in the phase, everything that happens is the same, but the signals don't go to the body in the phase. It turns out that for your brain, what you do in real life and in the phase are one and the same. That's why practicing skills works, and it's effective. That's the first alternative. The other one that comes to mind is when we talk about taking pills in the phase. Some studies say that most of the real medicines you can buy at the pharmacy actually don't exceed the effectiveness of a placebo. Even though you can buy most of those medicines at the pharmacy, that is, the placebo effect works in real life. But now imagine finding a pill in the phase, seeing it for real, swallowing it, and also immediately feeling the effect. That is, it's even stronger than in real life. In real life, you swallow it, and you don't know what will happen. But here, you feel the effect. I'll jump ahead a bit. As soon as you get results in the phase, that same exception arises as to when you can deliberately end the phase. If you end the phase upon getting results, those results naturally have much more staying power. Third point. I always ask beginning practitioners to carry out two interesting experiments. One, try to run the whole time while in the phase. Enter the phase and run as fast as you can, as long as the phase lasts. Run, run, as fast as you can. When you come back, 
you'll see that the body's autonomic functions react as if you were running for real. That is, you're out of breath, your heart beats more rapidly, blood might even flow to your muscles, you have shortness of breath, you even break a sweat, you might even feel tiredness and so on. That is, your brain simply doesn't understand. It thinks you're running and the autonomic nervous system starts helping you to run. That is, it doesn't understand that everything isn't happening for real and you can use that, it can be fooled. That's why we're talking about beneficial experiences. It's not only about physical action, but also those processes they bring about in the body. Here's another example that I always ask people to do. Remember how we talked about vodka yesterday in the context of self-healing? I'm actually asking you, if you want, of course, to try something alcoholic in the phase, for example, vodka. Why am I asking that? So you see for yourself that it's not just the taste, color, and smell. It's also the effect, and you can return and even feel it. The after effects might even persist. What's the point here? Simply that vodka is this clear demonstration of an entire spectrum of all kinds of things. Instead of vodka, tablets have the same effect, of course. But now let's discuss the things that are most relevant to us. They also allow you to look at the issue from a completely different perspective. Meanwhile, these studies were literally two or three years ago. They're brand new. For a long time, there were several mysteries of science nobody could figure out. I have some knowledge and brain physiology in mind. Mystery number one. If lab rats aren't allowed to sleep for five to seven days, they die. But when they dissect them, they figure it's something with the brain, but there's nothing abnormal about the brain. Meanwhile, their internal organs are covered by ulcers and twisted up. There are sores all over the skin, their fur falls out, and so on. It wasn't clear why that happens. Mystery number two is that it also wasn't clear why the brain in REM sleep is much more active than during wakefulness. It's as if we're sleeping, but the brain is doing something. Nothing in nature happens without a reason. There was a third mystery. Where is the second human brain located? In the stomach. In the stomach. There are that many neurons there, nerve centers and so on. It seems as if we don't feel them, but they're there. But why are they there? Apparently there's another human brain. That's how much of everything's there. And there was a puzzle. What was it all needed for? And literally a few years ago, a revolutionary study was carried out. It was done by a scientist in Moscow. Ivan Pigayov, if I'm not mistaken. There were cats in the experiment, but the cats didn't suffer as a result. He said they lived long lives at his country house afterwards. The experiment was so astonishing and changes how we see the brain and sleep so much that everyone in the world is still dumbfounded by it because it will be necessary to rethink the entire nature of how we see the brain, sleep, and so on. They made a clear-cut discovery. They observed the cats and discovered the following. When a cat falls asleep, the same region of a cat's brain responsible for vision during wakefulness. In cats, it's the occipital lobe. In humans, that's where the visual cortex is. In cats, the cortex they use to see. What does it switch over to during sleep? The intestines. That was determined without a shadow of a doubt. There were simply signals there, a correlation of signals. They saw impulses in the intestines and here in this part of the brain. It turned out that as soon as the cat stops seeing and falls asleep, the cortex of the brain that it sees with switches over to analyzing and processing signals from internal organs. In this case, it was the intestines. And the correlation of those signals was absolutely clearly traced. It's all publicly available. They discovered exactly why those rats or people die if you don't let them sleep. They don't die because something happens with the brain. The internal organs simply fail and can't work well because the brain doesn't control them. If you don't get enough sleep or stop sleeping altogether, you get chaos in the body because the brain isn't working. It's not controlling processes. 
From our point of view, that opens a whole way of understanding how we can influence our bodies. It turns out that various sleep-related states, in this case with the phase, it's long been not just theoretical, but long proven that we have a direct connection to our organs. Obviously, the question arises as to whether we're smarter than nature by interfering in a natural process. But that's a different topic for discussion. We've gone through several ways all this may be possible. But do you know what the paradox is? You can talk about it a lot, but it all remains poorly studied. However, any experienced practitioner with a long-standing practice has been carrying it out on themselves, trying it and experimenting. The most interesting thing is that anybody who does it knows that it works. So, the direct method. First we'll talk about it in theory and then go over the most important part. I'll say a few things right at the beginning. In most cases, the situation is as follows. Imagine the following. A 15-year-old student. He's skinny. His girlfriend dumped him. He needs to pump iron. He needs to hit the gym. He comes in the gym. The barbells are lying there. He's skinny and has never seen barbells before. He sees it's got 200 pounds of weight on it. He runs right up to it, grabs it, and heaves. He tries to lift it, to make it budge, but he can't even pull it off the floor. Drat, I can't do it. He sees the 400-pound barbell. He runs up to it. Now I'm gonna lift 400 pounds. I couldn't lift 200, but I'll lift 400 for sure. Sounds absurd? It sounds just as absurd to me when somebody says, it doesn't work for me upon awakening. That must mean the direct method is for me. I'm in control. I really feel it. The direct method is for me. That's the same as saying, I can't lift 200 pounds, but 400 is nothing. There are people who have a predisposition. They might be about 10% of the population. 10% have a predisposition for it. But 100% think that they are from that 10%. I feel the direct method. It'll suit me for sure. I'll tell you right from the start that even the 10% with a predisposition for the direct method for them, it works out easily on awakening as well. And for that very reason, it's better to start everything from the indirect method upon awakening. As soon as you've gotten some solid experience, you can experiment with the direct method. As soon as it works for you upon awakening, you can try the direct method at your leisure. But starting from the direct method, that's the very same mistake. That's the reason why the phenomenon itself has only just now started to leave the Dark Ages. Because everybody always only paid attention to the direct techniques. They used to think that leaving the body was when you lie down and leave your body. But techniques upon awakening were underappreciated for some reason. And from a purely psychological standpoint, people thought that something wasn't right. When you lie down and leave your body, sure. But upon awakening, something's not right. That is, my success rate upon awakening is nearly 100%. 95 to 100, about that. With the direct method, it's about 50 to 60 to 70% depending on various factors. Look, here's our main issue. The issue is that when you've woken up, the door is open. Just go in the door. Essentially, when you wake up, the door is open and you don't need to create the state. It's already there, and you need to learn to use it. In the direct method, you lie down, and you're in the waking state. The door is closed, and you need to learn to open it. That is, the open door. That's REM sleep. When you lie down, you're in the waking state. Naturally, you should first enter non-REM sleep and then REM sleep. And here's where a purely physiological barrier arises. That's precisely why anyone who knows anything about sleep cycles will always tell you there's no such thing as the direct method. It's an impossibility, since when a person goes to bed, they should fall right into non-REM sleep. Normally, you go to bed and are in non-REM sleep for about an hour and 20 minutes, and then fall into REM sleep for 10 minutes. Then you wake up again, even if you don't remember it. You fall back asleep, and so on. People who knew what they were talking about would say, that's totally impossible, that can't happen, that's physically impossible, but then you talk to people, you look at your own experience, and nothing could be further from the truth. People say it does work. They lie in bed and do it. That is, from a scientific point of view, it was previously impossible. But people said it works, and it even works for you yourself. Then it was discovered that it turns out REM sleep might start immediately in some situations, and that changes the situation right there. 
And essentially, what we'll be discussing in this case is how to fool nature, physiology, how to do it so that we can open that door. That is, we'll have two primary methods. Meanwhile, both were used accidentally during our lessons. We'll be talking about that. And so, the first way is to hack your physiology. Our task is to lie down and immediately turn up in REM sleep and use the techniques to appear in the phase. To that end, we also sleep so as to wake up in REM sleep and immediately appear in it. But how do you do it so you lie down and there's immediately REM sleep? That very same deferred method. Yesterday and today, several people accidentally entered the phase using the direct method. What did you do yesterday? You woke up to your alarm clock. You walked around. Yes, I didn't know you had to fall asleep. You lay back down and, yes, I went right into the phase. And that's it. And you entered the phase. Look, this is more or less how sleep cycles go. Here's the REM sleep you need to enter. This is the non-REM sleep stage. When you fall asleep in the evening and the body needs to restore itself, it goes into that deep sleep stage for a long time. The longer you sleep, the more the body sleeps off the need for non-REM sleep. And after, say, five or six hours, it's different for everybody. The body practically stops entering non-REM sleep. That is, you got up, walked around, and as the body doesn't need deep sleep, it goes into REM sleep practically the whole time. So, you sleep off non-REM sleep, get up, walk around, lay down, and start doing what? Techniques. The techniques right away without falling asleep to wake up later like before. Immediately start doing the techniques. That's the easiest way to fool the brain, to fool nature, to force the body to work the way you need it to. That's the deferred method. That is, you sleep off non-REM sleep, get up, walk around, wake up, and lie down. That's it. Our body is physiologically ready to open the door for us right away. We do the very same techniques. The techniques are all the same ones, but instead of three to five seconds, we can do them for a minute, for half a minute. Three to five seconds is upon awakening, and when it's the direct method, we do them for longer. There's no need to cycle or quickly alternate them. That's the easy part, and that's when you get the idea, I would like to come home in the evening and not wait until I fall asleep. I would like to do it without waking up at all. I would like to lie down and do it right away. Here we arrive at the second way to do it before night. This is going to be a long discussion. The first question I get is, how to lie down? Upon awakening, however you wake up is how you woke up, it doesn't matter how. But here I can like this or like that. And if there's a choice, that means one's better and one's worse. Body position. Tell me, what body position should I do direct techniques in? Raise your hand if you think that's comfortable for sleep. And uncomfortable? If I ask about various positions, we'll hear all kinds of answers. If you read some book on the topic, what do they usually advise? The corpse pose, that very body position. Now, raise your hand if you easily fall asleep on your back. Raise your hand if it's hard for you to fall asleep on your back. Some people raise their hands both times. It turns out that the same body position makes one person sleepy and another awake. You read all these instructions where one author after another says the same thing. Lie down on your back. I don't know how anybody could recommend a specific body position. That said, I myself used to recommend it. That was over 10 years ago. I didn't have mass results yet and hadn't been practicing for as long. Here's a question. If I know I'm really tired and fell asleep during an attempt yesterday, then what body position should I assume? The most uncomfortable one, one that's uncomfortable for sleep. That is, if you fall asleep during attempts, assume an uncomfortable sleeping position. If there's alertness, then what? A comfortable one, a comfortable one. Everything is quite simple. It might vary from attempt to attempt. Let's say you're tired one day, but alert the next. You might assume a comfortable position. Moreover, you can change your body position very easily during the process. That also goes against the popular wisdom of you lie down and try not to move no matter what. You lie down for half an hour, an hour, or two, 
If you so much as move a finger, you'll simply have wasted the two hours you spent. You're not allowed to move, no matter what. You can't stand it anymore. The pins and needles, sweat, torment, and itching all over. But you're not allowed to move, no matter what. I'll jump ahead and say that you'll be unable to cut off the phase right away with the direct method. That means you can move and change positions without worrying. Look, especially when you lie down, but really want to sleep, and so you lie down uncomfortably. If in a few minutes you suddenly feel alert during the process, then you lie down comfortably. Basically, you should pick a body position based on the situation. You can change it during the process. Nothing bad will happen. Moreover, your success rate will improve. People often do techniques for a long time, but nothing works. They think, screw it all. They lie down in another position, and it works. So don't be afraid to change positions. You won't cut off the phase. Always remember that. Did your ear start to itch? It's better to itch it than to lie down and suffer because your ear itches. I can talk about these absurd things because I've done them myself. Because I know very well what you're all going through and what you're doing. All right, we've picked a body position and lay down. Say I'm tired today. I lie down on my back because it's difficult for me to sleep on my back. It's hard for me to fall asleep. Okay, what to do? The following question arises. How long should my attempt last? An hour or so. Any other ideas? A few hours? Until it works? Other ideas. Until you fall asleep. Other ideas. Until you're fed up. More. 10 to 15 minutes. Say you've been lying down an hour or more, and it didn't work for you. You did it in the evening. What happens after that? Say it didn't work and you think, okay, I'll fall asleep, and you can't. You have trouble falling asleep. Because your body thinks, okay, I've already rested up. Look at what a dreadful situation arises. You lay down with these hopes, put in effort the whole time, but nothing worked out, and you got upset. You think, that didn't work, I've wasted my time again. I'll at least get some sleep before work tomorrow morning. And you try to fall asleep for another two to three hours. You wake up in the morning groggy and down. And after a second week of those kinds of attempts, a person gives up on the whole thing. Look, it's all not that complicated. First, no need to be hard on yourself. Everything should be fun. The solution is quite simple. 15 minutes. 15 minutes max. There's no point in doing more. Experienced practitioners say one and the same thing. As a rule, you get results in the first five to 10 minutes. Sure, it might work out that you enter the phase in 30 minutes or even an hour, but the probability of doing so decreases and the amount of effort you put in increases. But this curve will go the other way so much that there's no point in doing more than 15 minutes since the effort you put in isn't worth the success rate that follows. So, if it didn't work in 15 minutes, the world won't end. Tomorrow won't be the apocalypse, and life will go on tomorrow, most likely. No need to beat yourself up. You'll try again tomorrow. It's not the end of your practice. Lie down and just sleep well. Sleep is important too. Sleeping well is a large part of a successful practice. So if it didn't work in 15 minutes, it's okay. You'll try again tomorrow. No need to beat yourself up. No need to torture yourself. The phase isn't worth an hour of self-torture, especially when you can do it within a few seconds of awakening. To begin with, learn to do it upon awakening so you get guaranteed results, and then you can try periodically with the direct method. In fact, if you grasp the main points, it's not that hard. It's just that those points are so fine that it's really, really hard to grasp them. Remember, with the indirect method, we had common denominators like aggression, no matter what, and putting in your all. In the direct method, there's another principle that's fundamental. If you don't adhere to it, it doesn't matter what you do or when. Without this basic principle, nothing else matters. Many, well, 99% of practitioners, undervalue it. Those who do have success accidentally arrive at this principle or can't even identify it. What does it consist in? I'll tell you two stories. 
and then you tell me symptoms for the phenomenon. Story number one. Based on those years of self-torture I told you about, you all also do the same to yourself from time to time. I came to the following conclusion. Say I got the idea of carrying out some urgent experiment, one that was really interesting and really needed. So I'm lying down in the evening and really need to carry it out straight away. I'm really curious and really want to enter the phase. And I don't even try. Because I know that whenever there's excessive desire, whenever I need to enter the phase urgently, that most likely nothing will work out. My brain will be too active. I won't have transitional states. Most importantly, I've tried hundreds, if not thousands of times in that state, and nothing worked for me. I simply already know that there's no reason to try in that state. I wait until the next day and relaxedly, without really caring, lie down, and it works without being hung up on it. Story number two. This one guy got really into it. And he tried to leave his body every day, to use his terminology. He tried every day for half a year. He tried every day for half a year, and it didn't work a single time. And he went to some classes, to some talks totally unrelated to this field. And there, they beat it into their heads all day that if you need something in life, relax and let it go. And he says he came home after that talk and lay down for the first time in half a year and thought, if it works, great. If it doesn't, to hell with it and it immediately worked for him for the first time that evening. When I talked to him, his direct method success rate was about 60 to 70 percent. I've never seen a higher success rate before or after, because there are many factors at play. For example, something's bothering you and so on. After all, at those moments, we're sensitive to outside factors. Now tell me, what to call it? Let's list what you say. Decrease the importance. Indifference. I might have a lot of trouble spelling that word. <laughs> Go with the flow. Don't obsess. Say a healthy whatever. I'm warning you in all seriousness, even if you understand the next part of our lesson, when we discuss what should happen during an attempt, even if you understand all that, know all the techniques, know the textbook by heart, and know all our techniques and practices by heart, Without this here, the direct method is just in your dreams. Nothing will ever work for you. It's something minor, as it were, but it's a crucial factor. One of the main reasons is that if you analyze to excess, you deprive your body of transitional states. Yours is either switched on or completely off, since that's how the brain works. And now we're approaching what's most important. What should happen when I lie down? How do I enter the phase? How do I fool nature? Before I explain, I'd like to ask you a question. I'll ask for the answer after I explain it. Right, what's the question? Let's imagine a situation. Say I was 17 or 18, and I just found out about, say, the phantom wiggling technique. It boils down to trying to move your arm without moving a muscle. You take your arm and try to move it up and down without moving a muscle. It will gradually start to move. Moreover, you can even lie down and your arm will start to move within a few minutes. It's an absolutely realistic sensation, but if you open your eyes, your hand isn't moving. So I lay down in the evening and start to do phantom wiggling. First, I try to wiggle my arm. After a few minutes, my arm begins to move. I feel movement. Right away, the logic is my hand started to separate. That means I'm separating too now. That's it. Separation happened. My arm is separating. It's already moving out there. My astral arm has practically left my body. My arm has left. That means I'll leave my body now. You start to move that arm, move it up and down, and time goes by, 15 minutes, an hour, two hours. It was as if my arm had left, but it didn't lead to anything. That's day one. On day two, you lie back down and start to wiggle your arm again. It wiggles again. You think, well, how's that? I'm practically levitating already. I don't even feel my body anymore. There's already vibrations, some noises, and my hand is moving up and down. Nothing happens. On the third day, you again start to do wiggling. You do it, and wiggling happens. At some point, you realize it's already the phase. Very strong vibrations and noises. You get up and go. You return back to your body and joyfully run around the house. Hooray, now I know how to leave my body. The phantom wiggling technique works. On day four, you go back to bed. You go back to bed and start to move your hand up and down again. It moves up and down. 
Well, what's wrong? I left my body right here yesterday. You torture yourself for two hours, but nothing works. On day five, nothing works. Nothing works for an entire week. For an entire month, nothing works. Then with another technique, everything unfolds the exact same way. If you answer the next question, and we'll be able to formulate an answer to it, it will give you an absolutely clear understanding of what the direct method is. Here's the question. In the example I gave, why did the technique work on day three, but not work before or after? Right, first let's discuss the endings of the unsuccessful attempts, what they look like. Number one, so I come in, lie down, choose a technique and start doing it. For example, I start doing wiggling. It starts working. I lose consciousness. Then I wake up in the morning and recall what I did that evening. That's number one. Number two is like I said. You lie down and start doing phantom wiggling. Your mind is free floating. It gets distracted. I have the feeling of wiggling. I'll levitate right away. Just a little more and I'll leave my body. I don't feel my body anymore. It'll work now. I'm lying awake. That is, you've been lying awake the whole time. But what should actually happen? Why do we need active and passive techniques? Why do we need comfortable and uncomfortable body positions? Everything boils down to the following. For example, why would I lie on my back today if I decided to use the direct method? Because most likely, I'll be really tired. The seminar, flight, and so on. Say I lie down uncomfortably so as not to fall asleep. Because I'm super tired, I start doing some technique. I start to do it and my mind starts to check out and get sidetracked. I lose consciousness for a bit and then regain it. I can't fall asleep because I was doing techniques and lying in an uncomfortable position. That's why my mind turned on completely. And I feel there's no phase at all. I continue to do the technique. I start to do it and my mind goes off somewhere. It sinks, I space out a bit, and then I come right back to. You feel the phase isn't there yet. You need to deepen more. You start some technique again. You deepen into it, you space out, there might even be some microsleep. At some point you come back round, but having crossed a certain physiological line, your consciousness activates, but you're no longer in wakefulness. Now I'll explain to you what exactly happened here. But the idea is that you should turn off your mind bit by bit, dive deeper and deeper. What's the point? Sorry for being blunt, but as long as your monkey mind is working and firmly in control of the process of doing techniques, you can forget any phase or direct method, just rare occasional exits. For example, when your mind is working and saying, I'll leave my body now, wiggling is working. I've practically already levitated. There are some images. Why is it when people say that, you immediately know that nothing will work? They're controlling it. You can hear it from their words that there's control. The mind is involved in the process. Remember, our physiological state and consciousness, they're tied. Our consciousness is the fruit of what, of what state? Wakefulness, wakefulness. That is, consciousness and wakefulness go hand in hand. It turns out that if we need to turn off wakefulness, what should we do? Turn off consciousness. Yes, we should turn off our consciousness for at least some time. Because like a monkey with its hand in a jar, it will grab onto that banana and hold it. If you want to get your hand out of the jar, you need to unclench your fist. That is, your consciousness in this case. And it's as if there's a switch in your head. When your mind is turned on, you're in one state. You turn it off for a bit, and then some processes might happen in your body. If you want to enter the phase, then for at least a short while, you need to turn off your consciousness. Let it go. Yes, let go of the situation. Especially because when you lie down with excessive desire, what's in your head all the time is, where's the phase? I should enter it now. You're lying there the whole time. If your mind is working, don't even dream of getting anything. What else do those dips remind you of? What are they similar to? How is nature being hacked? Look, it's all microsleep of some kind occurring. Indeed, your task, to a large extent, is to create microsleep. Meanwhile, don't think you need to zonk out and then wake up. Sometimes those lapses are so shallow that they aren't always noticeable. They even border on just spacing out a little. Sometimes you can doze for about 10 minutes and not notice. 
Sometimes it's instant, sometimes seconds, and sometimes it's simply some small lapse. The main thing is to understand that you should mimic awakening. That's the point. The essence of the direct method is to mimic awakenings. Naturally, the deeper the sleep, the better the mimicry. Naturally, the more you want to sleep, the easier it will work. But there's no need to beat yourself up by undersleeping. And now the answer to the question, whoever I ask will answer. Remember, the question was, why did the phantom wiggling technique work on the third day? It didn't work before and it didn't work after, but on that day it worked. But what happened the third day? The first two days, I tried hard to enter the phase, and there I lay. And it all happened by chance, thanks to dips, to microsleep. But the next day, what do I think? That the technique worked. It seems to us that all those lapses in consciousness are some kind of trifle. It seems that intention and a whatever attitude are all some trifling matter. That the main thing is techniques. After all, we're doing techniques here. Everybody's looking for techniques. Technique is what should make a difference. But in fact, a technique in the direct method is only there to help. What is the technique necessary for here? To relax you. You pick a monotonous technique that puts you to sleep for there to be a dip. If you're too sleepy, pick active techniques and change them often. We had a guy like that. He was totally unable to do it at home, and so on. On the metro in the morning, using the deferred method, standing or sitting, he would enter the phase, at home, no way, no how. I've heard many stories about guards on watch. A soldier stands there falling asleep, but sleeping isn't allowed. They experience so many phases. Students at lectures have dips. That is, when a dip occurs, there might be a spontaneous phase. But there's nothing difficult about those dips. We'll be practicing them right now. If you're practicing in comfortable conditions, especially when drowsy in the evening, within a minute, dips can sometimes happen several times. Just go deeper, 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 and most importantly, don't over-dip. In the practice of the phase, you either fall asleep or enter the phase. And what do we regulate the process with? Body position and techniques, both active and passive, as well as frequency of changing them. There's another important point I'd like to make. You know it's even mentioned in the new version of the textbook. There's a lot to say about the direct method, but the main thing is to understand the principle of microsleep, of mimicking awakenings. In essence, that's your task, but upon awakening, also conduct yourself as you normally do in order to enter the phase. You observe yourself, practitioners, and probably the simplest description of the direct method. Do you know what it is? An attempt to fall asleep in an uncomfortable position. That's a super condensed description of the direct method, without any techniques, and so on. An attempt to fall asleep in an uncomfortable position, to conclude the theoretical part of the direct method. Your task is to understand that consciousness is what might prevent you from mastering some things. As long as you're controlling the process, nothing will work for you. To make the process easier, earlier it was called free-floating state of mind, but in the new version of the textbook, the word microsleep is used. It's quite easy to understand what needs to be done. You need to get microsleep, Mini fallings asleep. And essentially, you're doing microcycles of sleep. And what do sleep cycles end with? REM sleep. In doing so, you're hacking sleep by doing sleep microcycles. Now we'll relax for five to 10 minutes and practice dips. Now then, assume a body position based on what you listened to. That is, an uncomfortable body position if you're afraid of falling asleep quickly, and a comfortable one if you're too alert, if that's possible in our conditions. What is our goal? We will have two modules, two sets, during which you should use the knowledge you have to get the maximum amount of dips of microsleep. How can we achieve them? Through body position, comfortable, uncomfortable, as well as technique regulation and intensity. Techniques can be active and passive, in and of themselves. And sometimes it's enough to concentrate on a single technique and it starts to put you to sleep. The one thing I'd like to tell you is the following. You should lie down now and simply relax and catch dips and micro sleep if it comes on its own. You know, there's this joke that's not really a joke. Wanna fall asleep? Lie down and tell yourself, just don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep, and you'll fall asleep. It's the same here, but reversed. 
fall asleep, fall asleep, and you won't fall asleep. So simply relax, simply lie down, and those lapses in consciousness will naturally come to you a bit later. If your mind is too alert, you can switch it over to some other activities. Say you choose one technique, like rotation, for example. Say I'm now sitting on my chair and will use the technique of observing images. You simply start to peer into the emptiness before your eyes. And after some time images form, they become more intricate and lapses in consciousness start, as long as you can stay in your chair afterwards. So relax. During the process, you may change your body position, but carefully so as not to touch anyone, and not loudly. Focusing on breathing helps as well. If sounds from the street bother you, there's a very simple trick, visualization of sounds from the street. If a car goes by, imagine it. If a dog barking, imagine it. Another question arises, how to realize whether you're in the phase or not after a lapse? Was that microsleep successful or not? After each microsleep, simply try to get up and levitate. If you're unable to separate, simply go deeper into sleep. But as a rule, with the direct method, you'll immediately feel the phase. Okay, start now.
Right, literally a one minute break. Change your body position if you're uncomfortable. If you fell asleep, wake up. And one more time. Sometimes the lapses aren't noticeable. What I might personally count as lapses are spacing out, getting literally lost in thought. Lapses of some sort also occur in your thoughts. Try to separate every time you come out of a lapse and appear right at your goal. Okay, start now.
attempt. Slowly get up. Raise your hand if, over the course of that 30 minutes, you got no lapses in consciousness. Don't worry, it's normal. Who had one or two lapses in consciousness? Raise your hand if you had more than three lapses in consciousness. Who had a lot? Who can say they had constant dips out of consciousness? Though we don't have time to discuss it in detail, who had something similar to the phase just now? Do dreams count? No, a real phase like we discussed. Remember, somebody once asked me the day before yesterday, why do related practices often involve these experiences? When you do holotropic breathing or meditation, for example, so why? Dips, yes, if you meditated and had dips of consciousness, of course, it's possible that the phase will arise. If you do holotropic breathing or any other practice, if lapses in consciousness occur, it's possible that you'll reach the phase. Lapses can easily be learned. They even occur here in uncomfortable conditions. In the evening when falling asleep, when the body is retiring for the night, catch that wave and it's not too difficult. Catching that edge of the right state is a little difficult, of course, especially for beginners and men. The phase comes more easily to women, the direct method especially. Now I will briefly and quickly tell you how you'll carry on. Let me start off with what's most important. Two to three days of attempts per week. Then, once it starts working, do as much as you want. So long as most of your attempts are unsuccessful, devote no more than two or three days a week to your practice. If you try doing it every day, you'll burn out, nothing will work, and so on. The biggest strategic mistake when mastering this phenomenon is trying to do it every day. It's the biggest mistake in individual practice. You can't think of a bigger one. That's why our seminar isn't long. Once the lesson ends, relax. Do whatever you want until your next day off work. Do other practices and things. Take your mind off things. Give your brain a break from the phase. We don't even need to practice. No need to practice. Forget it. Do whatever you want. That doesn't mean nothing will happen for you in the meantime. As soon as you let go of a deliberate approach, a forced one as we call it, spontaneous experiences become possible. But I would like to emphasize that as soon as you get success on most attempts, do as many as you want. Even five days a week, six, seven. Even I myself don't try every day. Well, about five or six days a week is what I do personally. There are days when it's not on my mind. What else? For any complaints, questions, or personal consultation, you'll find me in the phase. I can give everyone my attention there. In what field did you carry out research? It's not important for now. You'll see everything once the results are in. It's not your job to know everything about that. You need to push yourselves forward while I give instructions. I provide instructions on how to teach, if anyone wants to teach. You can do it on your own. We have free textbooks for teachers, which contain all these technologies. If you want to operate under our school, then you can either find all that info on our website or write me. In terms of my being here, I had no interest in just coming and holding a seminar. These are research seminars, and even at this seminar, I managed to carry out experiments. But I always give it my all. And every minute here is a real pleasure for me. I find it extremely interesting and pleasant. But what is that due to? It's due to the fact that I really feel I'm giving you something. I get colossal satisfaction from your enthusiasm. You tell me what's going on with you, and I like how it changes your life, your future. 
You are the bearers of knowledge. You yourselves can grow, change your lives, help others, friends and family, and so on. And that striving to introduce something new in your life, that striving to plant a seed that might sprout and help research and development, that's what pushes me forward. All in all, I've given you everything I could. Everything else depends on you alone. Simply follow the instructions closely to live in two worlds. That's it. I should be going. Michael, where are you going? Thanks, everybody. I'm going to the astral plane. <laughs>